Hello everyone. Today's video is about a few different things actually. It's related to Lyme, it's related to IgM titers elevating out of the blue, it's related to whether it's important to cycle herbs or not, so I don't really have a concise title for this video, but that's what it's about. Um, just before getting into the video, if you don't mind, please taking a quick moment to like, share, subscribe, and or post a quick comment on the video. I'd really appreciate it, so thanks in advance for taking a quick second to do that. And as per usual, nothing I'm saying should be construed as medical advice. This is for informational purposes only. If you need medical advice, please talk to your healthcare provider to get that advice. So the question for today reads, I've been seeing a SIRS doctor for over a year, SIRS being chronic inflammatory response syndrome, um, oftentimes related to mold illness, and <clears throat> still am dealing with many symptoms. I recently found that my Lyme antibody titers look a lot better after a year, but suddenly relapsing fever IgM, which is a type of antibody, is high when it was low a year ago. I haven't gone outside much at all, and it's extremely unlikely I had any recent tick bite. Um, have you seen patients? patients that have a sudden increase in IgM due to relapsing fevers, fast, faster antigenic variation versus Lyme? Is there a different strategy to treating relapsing fevers such as cycling herbs since it changes more rapidly? So uh, very good questions, some really good technical questions in there. It's kind of a fun one to answer. Um, and uh, thank you for the questions. Um, so <clears throat> I... Um, in, in, in my experience and to my understanding, you know, being um, quite well versed in the research literature related to Lyme and, and co-infections for that matter, um, I think that when um, like IgM and um, relapsing fever are, uh, and, and Lyme and like Borrelia in general, it, it's an interesting topic. Um, it's one of the, if, you know, if you actually look at the um, you know, CDC guidelines in the States or the Health Canada guidelines here in Canada and I assume other um, national health authority guidelines in other countries as well where they talk about Lyme. Um, what's um, interesting is that the assumption is that an IgM um, antibody is a false positive when um, it's it's present in a person who's been sick with Lyme for uh, with um, Borreliosis for more than you know say several weeks um, or, or at least more than like a few months um, which is um, kind of crazy because there are research uh, studies that have specifically demonstrated that IgM antibodies can persist for a prolonged period of time in folks with chronic Borreliosis. Um, <clears throat> so it's it's kind of like this assumption that uh, elevated IgM is a false positive just because IgM antibodies are supposed to only you know stick around for several weeks after an infection and they give way mostly to IgG antibodies. Um, <clears throat> so it's, it's kind of an interesting, um, I would say, nuanced topic. Um, and um, I think that if I were to see that type of um, uh, shift in, in one of my patients, and I have seen these shifts before, like I think antigenic variation is, um, like an antigenic shift is something that's a, you know, most likely explanation as to why, you know, we might see antibody, um, IgM titers bumping up. Now, there is always the possibility of a person having a re-exposure. Um, you know, there was a mention here in the questions about like, oh, I you know, haven't had any tick bites or anything. And I think, can't remember now, I think I recently I talked about the semi-regular but I think I recently posted a video um, talking about how um, there is evidence of Borrelia being in other vectors beyond ticks like mosquitoes, black flies, horse flies, um, but there just aren't any transmission studies that have been done looking to see whether Borrelia is actually able to be transmitted through those vectors. So um, while there are anecdotal reports about, you know, um, scenarios that are incredibly likely, I think irrefutably um, likely that there is um, transmission of, uh, of Lyme via um, other vectors like mosquitoes. We just don't know if that's 100% definitively possible despite what you know um, real life experience has shown that it probably very much is um, so I, the reason I just mentioned that is because um, the assumption or the um, I, I mean not the, um, the uh, white held belief is that you can only get Lyme from a tick bite but I think that that is something that has not been definitively proven that that's the only way to get it um, you know mosquito bites black fly bites um, um, horse fly bites, like these are things that we encounter a heck of a lot more often than tick bites. And so I think um, it's just something to be aware of that maybe that is a mode of transmission that's possible. Um, <clears throat> but uh, bar barring something like that, then um, I think antigenic variation is a you know, likely explanation. Um, for folks who are not familiar with like what the heck is antigenic variation, um, basically there are these surface proteins that um, the Lyme bacteria can continually shift on its surface um, because 
that way it can evade the immune system. The immune system's like, okay, I'm finally ready to, you know, kill this Borrelia species, and then it shifts its antigenic um, uh, presentation, these kind of like uh, identification markers on its surface, so the immune system's like, oh, wait a minute, where was that guy that I was just, you know, trying to, you know, to get rid of, like, you know, oh, now there's this new person here, so it'd be kind of like, you know, in some silly, I don't know, Bugs Bunny-esque cartoon of like, oh, you know, you just like, you know, we're arresting someone with a red hat and now you know they're wearing a blue hat like where did that guy go um that that's on a you know very silly simplistic level kind of what happens with antigenic variation the immune system kind of gets confused and it's just one of the many mechanisms that Borrelia has in its um, trick bag to try to evade the immune system and often does so very successfully um there's another uh, point to the or a part of the question here that i was wanting to comment on which is a question about you know um is <clears throat> cycling herbs maybe a good choice because of that um, antigenic variation. Um, <clears throat> so cycling herbs is something that I've thought about for a long time because a lot of the um, clinicians out there who use more of an ant um, a pharmaceutical, you know, mostly antibiotic centric approach to treating chronic infections oftentimes will use this, you know, pulsing method, kind of pulsing between different antibiotics and whatnot. And for, you know, a long time, that's something that some um, clinicians who focus more on herbs and you know antimicrobial nutraceuticals and things like that um, have talked about as well like is it important to pulse those natural substances as well um, one of uh, my uh, greatest inspirations in the Lyme and co-infection world is the late great Stephen Buhner a wonderful herbalist wrote many uh, wonderful textbooks um, related to uh, or on the topics of Lyme and co-infections and herbal antibiotics and antivirals and things like that and just a, you know anyway, anyways can't say enough good things about the late Stephen Buhner um, and one of the things that he um, lectured about and also wrote about it in his books was and, and I don't speak for Stephen Buhner um, but uh, from my understanding from you know reading his work is that he was saying you don't need to pulse these th herbs you don't need to cycle through them um, my understanding is that's because every batch of herb is going to be different because it was you know harvested at this time of year or that time of year um, you know there's different extraction methods this and that um, there's um, not you're never going to get the same herbal formula twice and even though it's coming from the same company I mean Okay, if it's the same batch of tincture from the same company, yes, you could get it twice, but um, generally there's going to be a variation in the herbal formulas that you're getting. And so I think the herbs being just so varied are going to keep the microbes on their toes a lot more than say like, it's like, oh, penicillin always looks like penicillin. Oh, this microbe is now resistant to penicillin or doxycycline always looks like doxycycline then the microbe could potentially become resistant to doxycycline. Um, so in, in my experience, I've, I've played around with it a little bit over the course of time and, and years gone by, and just really didn't find that like switching from this herbal formula to that herbal formula really made a difference. The, the only exception to that would be if there's a patient who's working with an herbal formula that, in my opinion, my experience isn't really the, the most uh, potent targeted formula for the infection in question, switching to a better suited one could definitely make a difference. So if someone comes in and they're say, you know, and, and nothing against these herbs at all, but to say they're just taking say like teasel root and black walnut or something like that, it's like, ah, oh, like why aren't I getting better? And then, you know, we switch them over to something with cryptolepis and Ceta acuta and uh, Japanese knotweed and cat's claw. And they're like, oh, I'm feeling a lot better. It's like, well, yeah, switching to um, better selected herbs can be, um, certainly very impactful but if say I had a patient where I've got them on say those four, four herbs that I just mentioned and you know then I'm like okay they're they're just the patients kind of hit a plateau and then you know maybe I switch them over to say um, you know Chinese cat's claw which is which is butang or um, and you know Chinese skull cap and um, uh, alcornia and noclea um, the likelihood of them getting better uh, like you know sort of they weren't they plateaued on the formula one and then the likelihood of them getting uh over that plateau moving on to formula number two using these are all herbs that have sort of a um, i would say analogous um, systemic antimicrobial activity it's a very very rare to see any additional improvement over and above that um so um i, I think that the benefits of cycling through herbs I, I really haven't seen it in my own clinical practice again one of my you know um great inspirations in this area, Stephen Buhner, um, to my understanding, also didn't see that in his, you know, very, very long, illustrious career. Um, and so I, I don't know that um, it's an important thing to do. That being said, if anybody listening has experience where they've said, found like, oh yeah, herb cycling was really important for me, really helpful, love to hear about it, but that's just been my experience so far. So um, I hope 
person asking a question. Hope you're feeling better soon. Hope you get over your chronic symptoms soon. Uh, thank you again for the questions. And if anybody has any comments on other topics or, or well, sorry, comments on, could be comments on other topics, but comments on this topic or uh, anything else or questions uh, for future videos, please feel free to post below.